Now, at the same time, as soon as the king declared war, he promoted Governor Galvez to Brigadier General and sent him orders to take West Florida, to move east out of New Orleans and take West Florida. Now, Britain had, uh, at the time of the American Revolution, really about 26 colonies in North America, not just 13. There are the 13 that we think of, the 13 that rebelled. On the mainland also, there were the Canadian colonies that didn't rebel. Um, East Florida and West Florida didn't rebel, and then West Indian colonies that didn't rebel. Now, East and West Florida were invited by Congress to join the rebellion. Congress very much hoped that they would become the 14th and 15th states. Um, but these colonies were heavily, heavily subsidized by the British. Um, in, in, in some ways, they had sort of the opposite feeling of, of the British crown uh, to those in, in the, uh, most people in the 13 colonies, uh, the, the feeling that the British actually supported them instead of taxed them, so it took their profits. Um, these colonies had a sparse European population. They were mostly Native Americans. Um, and also, they were occupied by sizable British garrisons. So the thought of rebelling against the British what had a sort of immediate uh, danger to it uh, that it didn't in most parts of the 13 colonies. Um, therefore, there, they felt there was not much reason to rebel and not much chance of success. And the likelihood that East and West Florida would join the rebellion decreased over time because loyalists fled from the Carolinas to the Floridas um, as, as the rebellion took over their homes. So, taking West Florida for Spain did not look easy. Um, as I'm sure you know, as many of you know, you need more men to besiege fortifications than you do to defend them. Um, and it wasn't clear that Galvez was going to get reinforcements for a siege of Mobile or Pensacola. Uh, the loyalties of Louisiana's majority French population uh, were far from clear. Some of these French Louisianans had rebelled against Spanish rule in the New Orleans Rebellion only 11 years earlier. Um, hardly any people in Spanish Louisiana were actually Spanish. Uh, the Spanish had set up schools to teach young men the Spanish language, um, but still, uh, by the time that the war broke out, by the time that Spain entered the war, most Louisianans spoke Spanish poorly, if at all, um, and certainly didn't identify themselves as Spanish. Just a few months before Galvez got the news that Spain had entered the war, he had written to his uncle that members of the New Orleans Cabildo, which was Louisiana's council, um, were claiming, this will sound somewhat familiar, uh, were claiming imaginary rights in, in governing Louisiana. This body, Galvez wrote, composed of French individuals, maintains a spirit of rebellion and hatred for the Spanish nation, which they cannot hide. It seemed that he might have a rising rebellion for local rule right there in his own colony. Galvez despaired that he had been working to convert these French people to Spanish rule for more than two years, but without success. How would he lead these people into battle? So Galvez was going to need to persuade Louisiana's men and women, especially the French majority, that their hopes for independence and prosperity and local rule lay in the Spanish crown and not in the British. So what he did, what Galvez did, was he decided to keep this, the king's declaration of war on Britain a secret. He sent orders to his commanders out in the posts on the frontier um, to send him lists of male inhabitants who could be called into service if war came. He told them not to tell them they were doing that. Uh, he started um, improving New Orleans defenses, uh, secretly trying to amass vessels that could transport troops um, without anybody quite knowing. He invited Choctaws and Chickasaws and other Indians to New Orleans to urge them not to support the British. Uh, most British and Spanish officials felt if Indians in the Mississippi Valley were going to get involved in this war, they were more likely to side with the British than with the Spanish. Um, so he mostly just asked them to stay out of the war. Then, as Galvez was making these secret preparations, on August 18, 1779, Heavy storm clouds gathered over the Gulf of Mexico, and the winds grew stronger. Now, this, in this era before radar, people had to judge a storm by sight and sound and feel. And they couldn't know that this was a hurricane coming. It had been circulating in the Gulf for days as it grew to hundreds of miles across with winds of over 100 miles an hour. As the storm surged, it wrecked several ships in the lower Mississippi, 
And after landfall in the space of only three hours, the hurricane had demolished houses in New Orleans and the surrounding countryside. It had destroyed the harvest. It had killed livestock. Um, and it left the city, as Galvez described it, the most pitiful spectacle imaginable. Now, a hurricane, of course, is devastating under any circumstances. And this one could doom Spanish prospects in the war. The hurricane, as hurricanes tend to do, had not damaged British West Florida at all. Um, it had entirely fallen on the Spanish side of the Mississippi. Um, whereas New Orleans had lost the ships that were supposed to protect it and had focused New Orleanians on repairing their city. So it wasn't clear that Galvez was going to get them to abandon their cleanup efforts to work for, and fight for the glory of Spain, something they really weren't that committed to even before the hurricane. So only two days, two days after the hurricane, Galvez addressed the discouraged inhabitants of New Orleans from the Place d'Armes, which is today's Jackson Square in the French Quarter. He had married a local Frenchman, so he probably wisely had her by his side as he spoke to the French, and he, he spoke French himself. Um, he announced that Spain had recognized the independence of the United States. But he hid the truth. He didn't completely admit that Spain had declared war against Britain. He said, there is still peace, and Spain wants to keep the peace as long as England doesn't break it. But he said, New Orleans is in danger. He said, the British might start hostilities with us just as they did with the French. Galvez also told them that the mail from Spain had brought him a, a promotion to Brigadier General. And he told the crowd that he was sort of weighing whether to accept this promotion or not. And the crowd's kind of, what? He's young, he's brave, he's ambitious. What, what, would he refuse this promotion? Galvez assures the people listening to him that even without swearing an oath to the king, uh, he said, I would shed the last drop of my blood for my sovereign. But he says, I'm not sure I can give uh, the oath that this promotion requires, given the unfortunate state of the colony with the few troops that I have. He said, this would surely be a hollow oath unless the people of Louisiana promise me to fulfill it. And they take the bait. They, uh, at least according to Galvez, they showered him with effusive, effusive compliments. They assured him of their loyalty. And he wrote, he wrote his uncle, they almost carried me in their arms into the cabildo, forcing open the doors without waiting for the keys. Uh, inside, he said, they hailed me with the greatest acclamations of joy and promised me they would sacrifice their lives in service to the king and do the same with their property. So it worked. Eight days after the hurricane, the city's still a mess. Galvez rode out of the city alongside his, his officers with his regulars and militia beside him. Uh, to recruit more followers in the French and American Indian communities north and west of New Orleans. Now, a little bit later, the morning of September 9th, 1779, Galvez was addressing another crowd, not far from the British post of Manchac. Manchac was right on the border, on the Mississippi, on the border between, um, between Spanish Louisiana and British West Florida. Um, so sort of the, the closest British po po post that the Spanish could attack. They're close to the British post. Um, there are 600 militiamen in the crowd by this point, uh, including French-speaking Louisianans, um, British refugees, immigrants from the Canary Islands, members of the free black and mixed race militias. Um, there are about 500 regular Spanish troops, plus 20 light cavalry. Um, they were joined by 160 Indians of the lower Mississippi, including Homa, Six Towns, Choctaws, and Alabama Indians. And seven Americans marched with them under an American battle flag. Once Galvez started to speak to the troops, his interpreters conveyed the startling news that he had kept secret. The king, the king of Spain, had not just recognized the independence of the United States, he had declared war on Britain, and he expected the people of his empire to do their part. A roar of appreciation broke out. The men followed Galvez as he lifted his saber and turned his horse toward British Manchac. Now, it was an easy conquest that day. The uh, British commander of Manchac, Alexander Dixon, Dixon, had actually already evacuated the post and, and set up his, his defenses at Baton Rouge, 50 miles north to the northwest. Um, now, the reason Dixon moved to Baton Rouge uh, was that it was a much more defensible post. Spanish scouts reported back to Galvez 
that, uh, that the tall earthen fort at Baton Rouge was protected by a ditch 18 feet wide and nine feet deep and a stockade of sharpened vertical stakes. Now Galvez knew that he did not have enough provisions for a long siege. But on the other hand, he didn't want to risk losing a lot of men in an assault, as he wrote, considering that most of my small army was imposed of inhabitants and that any setback would cover the colony with mourning. Though the militia supported him now, they were enthusiastic to fight behind him, um, but they and their families could easily change their minds once casualties began. Now, George Washington knew this lesson very well. Militias could be extremely useful if used wisely. They were considerably better fighters when defending their homes than when sent off someplace that they didn't care as much about. Galvez wrote his uncle, I am certain of their goodwill, but your excellency knows very well that one cannot count on them because as war is not their profession, they do not wage it with enthusiasm and always have in mind, in view of the danger, the consideration of their family. I think that's a really astute observation of, of how you inspire men who aren't professional soldiers. In addition, Galvez knew that Spain was going to need these men and their families for the future of Spanish rule if Spanish Louisiana was going to be a viable colony, and he knew that Spanish immigrants were unlikely to, uh, to come to this place far from the center of, of, of Spanish colonialism. Th these people were going to need, uh, he was going to need their support, uh, and um, they would be the people of Spanish Louisiana in the future. He explained his thinking, in every action that I fear will be bloody, I do all that is possible to conserve the lives of militiamen, who are fathers of families which comprise half of the colony. In these, we have hope of the future. So he thought over what he, you know, he didn't want a long siege, but he didn't want a dangerous attack that he might lose a lot of men to. Um, so he chose deception. So around Baton Rouge, there was an ideal place for establishing batteries to attack the fort. Uh, it was where the forest grew a bit close to, to, the, to the fort. So to that spot, um, after nightfall on September 20th, Galvez sent a detachment of Alabama Indians and white and black militia. And their orders were to look and sound busy. So they did some digging, they did some hammering, uh, they um, occasionally fired a gun. Um, so the British noticed them right, and started firing on these decoys, as they were, while on the other side of the fort, in a just sort of slightly less advantageous but still somewhat hidden spot, um, enslaved laborers were digging real trenches. They built up dirt to, protect, to form a protective parapet. They mounted cannons. Now, during the night, the British within the fort at Baton Rouge uh, heard some of the hammering, the real hammering going on, building the wooden platforms to mount the cannons on. Um, they realized their mistake, and they changed the direction of their firing. Um, but the earthworks were com completed by then. Um, they sheltered the Spanish from British fire. And once the sky began to lighten on the morning of September 21st, Galvez ordered his artillery to open fire. After three and a half hours, the Baton Rouge fort was in such bad shape that Dixon surrendered. In surrender no negotiations, Dixon uh, agreed to give up Natchez as well, which was farther up the Mississippi, is farther up the Mississippi, um, because it would be completely cut off, uh, and, and he figured he might as well um, give it up too. After a day to bury their dead, 400 regular British troops and about 100 militia paraded out of the British fort. The regular troops surrendered their arms and became prisoners of war, while the militia returned home on the promise not to fight Spain anymore. Now, about this time, good news had arrived in the Spanish camp that three war sloops and four transports had arrived from Havana with 650 regular uh, troops and provisions and supplies. Now, even with these reinforcements, the Spanish forces were relieved not to have to win Natchez, to take Natchez. It sat high up on a bluff above the Mississippi. Eventually, the Spanish probably could have starved the people out, but the effort would have meant tying up its resources and causing damage and outrage to the people they hoped to incorporate in the Spanish Empire. Now, as Spain's amb ambitions are growing to take West Florida, they're thinking they will be able to bring British people into the Spanish Empire as well. 
Following on these victories in the early month of 1780, Galvez led his naval and land forces against the British fort at Mobile. Uh, the British sent more troops to the Gulf, but delays and confusion about what, what, whether Galvez was going to attack Mobile next or Pensacola next prevented their effectiveness. They're sort of spread out. And several hundred Choctaws who were coming to the defense of the British didn't get there in time. Um, Galvez's forces constructed batteries near the fort at Mobile and bombarded it until it surrendered on March 12, 1780. 